All this is Dr. Mubeen Sayed from drbeen.com. Welcome to one more show. So I hope you liked the previous talk. We'll continue on that. I hope the buffering is not too bad. And I hope you would continue to like and subscribe and share. So welcome. Here is the, the disclaimer. So please keep the disclaimer in your mind. Pause the video, watch it, read it. And here is a disclaimer on the bottom. This is not a medical advice. This is medical education only. OK, so where are we? How is everything? And that is interesting. So just watch a bit of Dr. Sunil Tan from UK. He's going through the same thing as Dr. Bean. So I think um, there is just a lot of, uh, there's a lot of emotion. There is a lot of uh, incorrect positioning. And if you look at the both sides, so uh, the sides, I thought that I had always been sitting in the middle, <laughs> that vaccines can be good, and there are sometimes side effects as well, and we should be wise about them. For example, UK is wise about them to say, under 40 years of age, don't give uh, AstraZeneca. Or if some women had AstraZeneca as a first dose, let's give them a messenger RNA as a second dose. This is wisdom. Nothing bad in that. They're protecting their people. Or saying that, for example, uh, in Israel, in many countries of Europe, to say that if somebody had an infection and they recovered, we would consider that for a certain period of time to be protective. And then they don't have to have a vaccine. That is wisdom as well. Yes, they're saying it's not forever. It is for six months or X amount of months. But still, they are at least considering it. So um, I thought I was sitting in the middle. Both sides, let's say pro-vaccine, there are extreme pro-vaccine as well, who say that anybody who didn't have a vaccine is causing an issue. And then there are extreme on the not liking vaccine group who says that anybody who got a vaccine is an experiment now and they have this 5G connected to them and that, that, that is extreme one, one group. And so they, there are too much emotion in there. And what I have seen is it's not necessary for, for us all um, to always be able to articulate and discuss in ways to discuss. And I'll give you an example. Last two days, it was very interesting for me. I am more than 50 years now. That is enough of an age for me to be a little more wise. But I still have that um, some naivety in me. And I, for example, when we discuss these vaccine efficacy numbers, even yesterday, when I explained the previous numbers, and I explained the data produced by Public Health England or by Office of National Statistics UK and explain how did they come, out, come about with the uh, death rate and so on. Even then there were comments that you are not showing the correct data. While there was no data smithing at all from me, it was just a presentation and the even email was what Public Health England had sent. There, is, there was nothing from me. Even then it made many people very upset. So I, I think that um, this is just part of life. And this tells me, I always get fascinated by this. Uh, I forget the name of that doctor who had said early 19th century that doctors should wash their hands after post-mortems and before uh, delivering babies. So in those days, doctors would go do, they would do forensics, so they'll do postmortems, 
and then they would go and deliver babies too. So there was no specialities like we have today. And the death rate in newborn was very high and death rate in women delivering babies was very high. So this one doctor found out that if you wash your hands after touching dead bodies and then deliver the babies, then the death rate is really reduced. So he said, hey doctors, hey medical community, these deaths are our fault. We should wash our hands. We should be more hygienic about it. And they, he was ridiculed. He was thrown in a mental ward. He died in that ward. He was thrown, just like today, you would see so many of the articles which are saying that doctors who are talking against vaccine should be thrown in jails or their licenses should be canceled. Or they, There are so many such discussions. Even this morning, LA Times, they didn't say throw in jail, but they, they used... Uh, Corey's name, they used others' names to say, why are there no repercussions? And this is very similar to, hey, wash your hands, and we would declare anyone who says wash your hand to be the bad guy. I think the truth is somewhere in the middle. There is a lot of benefit of vaccines. Imagine this. Yesterday, we looked at that table. I am so impressed that... In those who were not vaccinated, 37% of the deaths in not vaccinated were because of COVID. The remaining were for other reasons. And those who were vaccinated, only 0.8% deaths were because of COVID. Although you would agree that people who are vaccinated have at-risk folks, folks with comorbidities, folks at higher ages and so on. So that's a lot of efficacy. At the same time, there is vaccine-related clotting issues as well that we are aware of. There is cardiac inflammation that we are aware of. And we have to be ready. UK has a very good solution to that. So what is so bad in looking at our approach according to the knowledge that we gain. And that, I think, is important. So uh, <clears throat> how is everything? Bob channel, yeah, so that is the kind of thing that was happening. Thank you very much. JLB, thank you very much. Lizzie, um, I think so too. I think here is what happened. <clears throat> I think there is a mandate from the chief executive of the country to say, get more people vaccinated. And, and there is nothing hidden about that. And again, I have always been very, very clear that I don't have a position for, for politics in these discussions. But it seems to me that because there is a mandate, there is a, there is a more um, aggressive look at trying to figure out how do we get more people to be vaccinated. I still believe... So again, you know that I have taken vaccine, my, my family has taken vaccines. Um, I do not stop anyone. I actually encourage folks to go get your vaccine. That is important. And I don't want to be the guy who gets his own vaccine, but tells others not to get a vaccine because it is a problem. At the same time, if there was this leadership that was saying, we have seen following stats. Imagine UK's leadership, how they are thinking. Look, they did things which, <laughs> which I was impressed. When they decided to increase the distance between the two doses, I was at that time very critical of this. I was not happy because the reason I was not happy was the trial for the vaccines had a set 
distance between the two doses and we should then implement the vaccination with that distance. That is what trial had proved. But UK decided to change it and they actually had a better outcome. Then these decisions to say, okay, uh, adenovirus based vaccines in women, let's not give them the second dose to prevent any um, harmful effect or under a specific age, don't give a vaccine of this type to prevent any harmful effect. These are wisdoms. Anyways, I'm now repeating myself. <laughs> Doug is here. Hey, Doug, how are you? Welcome. Kwa says, Congress members and their employees are exempt from mandates. Really? That should not happen. Why should they be exempt? Zen Solo says, what's your take on reports about amino acid lysine for effective treatment and prevention for COVID? I have not read that report yet to be able to talk from a mechanism point of view. I still believe, uh, so the chief's mandate we're talking about, I still believe if, imagine if you are um, a person who's deciding I want to take a vaccine or not. And the administration comes to you and says, we have the following data for your age, for your gender, for your vitamin D levels, for the type of vaccines. And now we have vaccinated, let's say, worldwide a specific vaccine of type this of so many hundreds of millions this much of the time this is our learning we think a person of your age your gender your comorbidities will benefit from this vaccine rather than this vaccine don't you think that you would be more uh, willing to listen and you would feel that you are more confident about the message I think that confidence still needs to be. So what is happening is that confidence building is not there, but killing the messengers is now going on. Where, how should we get Dr. Mubin to be quiet? How do we get Dr. Corey to be quiet and so on? So that is what is now the way to move forward. Um, Rome Town Girl says, can you explain any concern about adenovirus vectors in terms of putting double-stranded DNA in the nucleus of the cell? Also, any need to worry about viral integration with JNJ? So uh, again, cannot give you a personal advice or, or uh, opinion, but from a mechanism point of view, we know this, that number one, there is no concept of adenovirus DNA integrating into our DNA. These are non-replicating non-integrating DNAs, that's one. And they've been built that way. They've been modified. And uh, second part, uh, in terms of putting double-stranded DNA in the nucleus, our nucleus would actually pick them up and destroy them at, at the end of the day. So yes, it is going into the nucleus, but it is just going and doing its function and then getting destroyed. It is interesting to see that J and J vaccines DNA stays and creates antibodies for a longer period of time. Or let me back up. Don't know if the DNA stays there for a longer period of time or not, but the, the immune system response continues for months and keeps increasing. That's an interesting mechanism. What is behind that mechanism, I do not know. Robin says, uh, always like all your videos. Thank you very much. What mean that my antibodies from blood test 140A while doctor's office said NL250? How effect one gets booster? So <clears throat> for any test where there is a level, I can't sit here and say what is the correct level because every test has a threshold on it. So if you look at your test report, it would say, 
at this threshold it is above this is positive below this is negative so that is what would help you understand what is the if it is above that and positive that means the immune system has responded if it is below that then it is not responded or it had responded in the past and enough time has gone by that the test result are now dormant or less that is how to interpret it not really commenting upon your tests specifically So Cyber Nurse says, Dr. Bean, we don't hear anything about J&J &J immunity or stats anymore. For those of us like Queen Bean, who took the single J&J &J dose, how confident do you feel? So my wife had J&J. &J. She still has very low, but she still sometimes have the flare ups of the side effects. And she goes to her doctor and doctor says it is vaccine side effects much less now that she's normally functional. She goes out, she comes back, she's comfortable. But sometimes she says, hey, my my um, knee joints are aching. This tells me that her immune system is still on it. That means if she gets infected, immune system would respond because it is still working. Now, what is the exact efficacy? Just like we have Pfizer data, I don't have that data for J&J to actually say, like Pfizer says in Israel, they have the whole data out there. I wish that I had that kind of data for J&J to make a more educated statement, but I don't have that data. And that data should be there. Barbara, how are you doing? How is Lotus? So Doug says, thank you so much for educating us and caring so much. Many blessings to you and your family. Thank you very much and blessings to you as well. Stay safe and healthy and healthy. So London says, is one dose of Pfizer enough to prevent severe disease? That data is not there. What we know from UK studies that I had discussed in the past, again, Israel and UK have done a great favor to the world that they are continuing to provide data and they are organizing it, they are making hands on it, they're doing studies and after studies. Uh, UK study, about Pfizer one dose or other vaccines one dose was that efficacy improves as the time goes by. However, what I do not know is, does that efficacy translates well towards prevention of the severe disease? I do not know about that. So I would look for that data, but this is true that it never reaches the efficacy of two doses, but it increases from where it started. Patizik says, my ex still has joint pain as well. He has a lot of colds as well, unusual for him. He had Pfizer. Yeah, so various vaccines do have, in some cases, side effects. And thank you very much for all the super chats. <laughs> so Hillman says, I heard obesity is the cause of cytokine storm. I'm 75 kilogram weight. Is that bad? So once again, uh, I can't give you an advice. I cannot comment on a specific person and their situation. The data for the COVID effect, obesity is one of the top risk factors to cause severe or to end up with this severe disease. Having said that, I cannot um, think about you because I don't know if it is if you're obese or not. Your weight is then looked at 
with your height and then your gender and all of those things together come back with if you're obese or not. So this is something that you have to discuss with your doctor or Google for your age and then your weight. And then based on that, you would know you're obese or not. Have a healthy lifestyle in general for everyone. Have less stress, uh, stressful life if you can uh, go out for walks. And nowadays, I'm not going out for walks. So for me to say this to someone to go out for a walk when I am myself not going out is wrong. So I'm disclosing it that nowadays for some weeks now, I haven't gone out for walks. But go out to walks where there is aroma of the trees or plants because those Fantone sites are very good in improving the natural killer cells functions. And please talk more in detail with your doctor. Somebody had uh, made this comment that I keep saying all the time that talk with your doctor and doctors are not able to educate us. That is a sad thing. Ideally, at this time, we are all, the whole world, all of us, Look, you are here. If there was no pandemic, you would not be spending time like this with me. You would not have probably even found me. We are all in exceptional states. We are all having to do exceptional things to protect each other. And one part on the doctor's side is I know that they're working very hard. They're, they're looking at their patients. They're managing them. But educating themselves and understanding clinical approaches as well. Paul B says, what are your thoughts on the sanitized nasal spray you talked about five months ago? So I still like the idea and it got approved in a couple of countries as well. I believe UK and Israel looking to the Taiwan, but generally I loved it. Arubaga, that is a very important advice. Mouthwashes are generally very good. Somebody said that Listerine has put that on their site that it will not kill the COVID. And I understand Listerine, if somebody just starts using Listerine to say, now I cannot have COVID or COVID cannot do anything to me, that is not correct. So think about it for a second. If I did Listerine or some other mouthwash, gargle, which is antiseptic mouthwash, the gargle is finished and now my mouth is going to start developing the bacteria and viruses again. So it is hopefully keeping the mouth clean and no nasal area clean, but it cannot just protect it forever or just protect it. But it is a good thing. Yes, Janet Maslate says, Maslate says, natural killer cells, forest breathing. Absolutely. Uh, light exercises. Forest breathing, staying happy generally helps improve the natural killer cells function and count by reducing epinephrine levels. So to anyone who is going to review the video, epinephrine reduces the production of natural killer cells and the function of natural killer cells. This is a normal medical function, physiological function that we know. And when you are relaxed and you're happy and you're rested and you've done light exercises or you're near plants, the uh, epinephrine levels go down and natural killer cells function and number improves. And there is a study, I had discussed that study from Japan where they did this uh, study on natural killer cells. So Jamile Zal says, hi, Dr. Bean, had Pfizer in June, did an at-home at antibody test. I still have antibodies. June, July, August. Okay. okay. How does one know when the efficacy is getting less? So there is no way to know that. 
other than you getting titers and then seeing how the titers are reducing over time. At home, test would only go positive or negative. But if you really wanted to understand how antibodies are doing, you have to just continuously serially get their counts to see what is the graph. Gold Country says, did you see, see the YouTube link I sent to you yesterday? Went to info. Um, they didn't forward that to me. I'll ask them. <laughs> Genesis Light says, what is your favorite Pakistani dish? I love chicken kadai. I double dose the cumin and turmeric when I cooked it. So Genesis Light, first, I have an open challenge for cooking the best chicken kadai in the world. <laughs> so I think I make very good chicken kadai. That also means that I like it too. So chicken kadai I love. Uh, Nihari is another thing I love. And then, of course, biryani is my favorite as well. Aloo gosht, <laughs> potatoes and meat is also a lot of fun. The change that has occurred in me since living in the US is that I cannot handle spicy food anymore. Um, I used to handle a lot of spicy food, but I can't anymore. Jiang says, put your uh, recipe in your website. It is. So this website where this video is, if you go six, seven years ago, you will see Dr. Bean making chicken kadai, or you could just search in my videos, chicken kadahi, and you would see my video. Not the best quality. Uh, you know, the, the pans are searing, and there is sound of sizzling and all that, and I'm speaking in the middle of this too. But I think it's a, it's a fun video to watch. <laughs> Kelly says, I'm going to have to tell my children to cooperate so I can optimize T-cell functions. Yes, yes. Say I am in T-cell function optimization state. Just go away and don't bother me. Or ask them to optimize their T-cell functions too. Now, we know that for children, they already have better NK cells. They, their NK cell count is more and the function is better. Merrick. So today, uh, Dr. Paul Merrick, he sent out a paper about turmeric. I was thinking of doing that paper, but I started the series for the androgens. Uh, he sent out a paper that turmeric is very, very useful for inflammation. Lynn Scott says, is there a test that could determine if a person had the disease 18 months ago? So unless you had a PCR type test at that time, the other possible test is T detect. I do not know if it can still detect after 18 months, but that is the only chance other than going to bone marrow and doing a bone marrow biopsy to see COVID plasma blast in there. That would be too much. <laughs> Rima says, yes, Nihari. Nihari is good. It's a, it's a beef stew. Eric Dog says, turmeric better absorbed by black pepper. I did not know that. So it is today's a cool talk. We have <laughs> morphed into recipe discussion. I did not know that turmeric is better absorbed by black pepper. But I I make good chicken kadai and I use turmeric as well. So can you share the link to the turmeric study? Let me see if I can actually. So Dr. Merrick sent that as an attachment. Maybe on the attachment, there is a, um, let's see. I'm going to share my screen for a second and just show you what it is. And you can probably then search for it. Uh, give me one second. So 
So it says curcumin regulate. So this is in Elsevier. So again, for the reviewers on YouTube who would look at this manually and say this is dangerous, this is Elsevier. And it says curcumin regulates the differentiation of naive CD4 T cells and activates interleukin 10 immune modulation against acute lung injury in mice. This is very, very interesting. So if I could, for a second, let me put my board up. I'll explain what the heading says. Uh, I'm going to buy the mouse without so much noises. I know some of uh, cool beans become upset. So <clears throat> let's say here is this. And now we, the study says, I'm just looking at the head, heading. I haven't read the whole study yet. Curcumin regulates the differentiation of naive CD4 T cells. So let's say here is a macrophage. And the macrophage, or let's make it angry macrophage. Macrophage has, let's say, bound the, the toll-like receptor, TLR or PAMPs. They have connected with the, with the what is this, SARS-CoV-2. And they brought it in, and they phagocytosed it, and they broke it down, and they are now presenting it to the adaptive arm. This is the innate arm. Correct. Now, on the adaptive arms side, the naive T cell will come and connect here. So this is T helper zero or naive T cell. It is naive because it doesn't know what is it going to be. Is it going to become T helper two or become T helper one? And that depends upon what do you pour on it. If you pour interleukin four and not interleukin 12, then it becomes a T helper 2, which then works with the B cell to become a plasma cell, which is an active B cell, which makes antibodies. And then if you pour interleukin 12 on it, then it becomes a T helper 1 cell, which activates a cytotoxic T cell. Now, what it says is curcumin regulates the differentiation of naive CD4 cell. So this is called the naive CD4. All of these helper cells are called CD4. They are cluster of designation four. They have proteins on them that are designated as number four. And you can see that this is actually this cell that is becoming this cell or becoming this cell. So of course, if this is CD4, then they are gonna be CD4 too because it's the same cell. Um, so CD4 T cells and activates interleukin 10, 10 immune modulation. So First, it regulates the differentiation, meaning becomes this or this. Curcumin, curcumin helps regulate this modulation, this moving in one direction or the other, and activates interleukin 10. Interleukin 10 is usually released by T helper 2, and that suppresses the innate arm or calms down the innate arm. Now, we know that the cytokine storm in COVID related patients is usually because this adaptive arm is activating again which part usually more on this side is activating the innate arm so if you release a lots of IL-10 that would actually calm down the innate arm so the curcumin is supposed to help number one regulate T helper zero cell differentiation. And secondly, it helps increase interleukin 10. That in, ten, in turn reduces the activity on the innate arm side, which will be useful as well to reduce the cytokine storm. Interesting paper. So hopefully you can search for this uh, Title, Curcumin Regulates the Differentiation of Naive CD4 T Cells and Activates Interleukin 10 Immune Modulation Against Acute Lung Injury in Mice. So this is an in mice uh, study.
So eat more beans says, is there a study out of Japan that discusses nanoparticles in organs and bone marrow after 48 hours of vaccine? Yes, and I have done two talks about it. Um, so you can actually uh, search for those. But yes, there is a, it's not really a study. It is a paper that was produced on the request of Pfizer, which looks at the uh, metabolism of lipid nanoparticle, two parts of the nanoparticle. And the reason for that was that the remaining part of the nanoparticle and messenger RNA's metabolism is known. So imagine you are a scientist and you are making a new drug. In that drug, you are using three or four components of existing of things that have been used in other drugs or are part of our body. For example, some cholesterol pieces are part of our body's cholesterol as well. So you know their metabolism. You know how, what do they do in our body? How are they broken down? How are they eliminated? Most of the time we have to see if a drug or a chemical substance, does the liver break it down and eliminate that through fecal route? Or does the kidney eliminate it through urinary route? Or is it a combination of two with some percentage on one route and the other? Or is it going to be um, excreted, some of it, or eliminated through breathing? Is it going to appear in saliva? Is it going to appear in our sweat? And so on. So this is important to understand the metabolism of any drug. So the the paper that was produced and give me one second i'm gonna let luffy back in so one second hey luffy <clears throat> sorry so the paper that was produced was to look at so uh, going back to this discussion, let's say you are the scientist and you have made a drug with six components. Four of the components, you already know how do they behave in our body. Two are new components and you want to understand how are they behaving in the body. That was the study that they did to understand these two parts of the lipid nanoparticle. Where do they go at the injection site? How long do they stay there? Where else they go in the body? who breaks them down, how are they eliminated, and so on. So I have done that discussion. I've reviewed that paper twice. When I reviewed it the first time, it became such an issue because people thought I was uh, uh, not correctly presenting it. Then I sat down with a friend from Japan who read it to me and, and translated it. Verbatim, I kept asking him, how about this sentence, how about this? Then I presented it again. Still, that brought a lot of heat on me. <laughs> Adina says, if ivermectin alters gut microbiome, is it enough to cause dysbiosis? Perhaps adopting an aggressive pro program of pre and probiotics to rebuild good bacteria in the gut. Uh, I am not aware of ivermectin causing dysbiosis. But generally, there is a paper that, again, Dr. Paul Marek had sent out. That paper showed that in severe, that is actually a research by Dr. Paul Marek and his team, which showed that severe patients had a gut dysbiosis. I asked him this when he shared that. I asked him this question. I said, uh, is it that the gut dysbiosis is causing or contributing to the severity or is the severity of the disease contributing to the dysbiosis? And he said, I don't know. But we are seeing this association that in severe patients, there is gut dysbiosis. And he said that means we should think about uh, microbiome or na natural normal flora's re-establishment so that the severity, hopefully severity would 
reduce or be prevented. So that's a very, very interesting point. <laughs> Gift 24 says Luffy misses the YouTube. He doesn't care for us anymore. He goes out every day and runs around, uh, plays with squirrels, or he thinks he's going to eat them up, and then quarrels with other uh, cats. And then at this time, he comes back, and now he's gone to go eat his food. He has become. So Aaron says, has it been determined whether or not use of monoclonal antibodies will reduce immunity post convalescence? So here is Luffy. <laughs> not use, uh, determined whether or not use of monoclonal antibodies will reduce natural immunity post convalescence. So, um, uh, Aaron, if we talk about a study to explain this, then I haven't seen a study to, to say it either way. Uh, however, I would, I would not think that that is going to happen. So here is why. Let me explain the mechanism. So he is back, Luffy, and now he wants to go to the other room. Luffy's a he's the boss in the house. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, Aaron, I think the way to I'm just gonna think aloud with you. I may be wrong. Uh, here is the virus enters in our body, gets a bunch of cells as its target, infects them, damages them, comes out and has a bunch of daughters. Correct. When we feel that the person has the symptoms developed, we say, okay, give them the monoclonal antibodies. That may be Regeneron or other. Correct. Now, the question really is, is there, when the monoclonal antibody comes in and it is going to start wiping off the virus by binding with it, did the immune system get a chance to become trained? And was there sufficient quantity of the virus to train it? And my thinking is this, and I'll, I'll give you my logic. Patient was given antibodies because they had symptoms. Symptoms mean their damage. And we also know that symptoms appear at least two to three days afterwards. So let's say exposure was here, then two to three days were spent, and then the symptoms appeared. This is the shedding time, right? So let's say there's total three days with Delta. It used to be five days. Now, during this time, adaptive arm has become also activated or it's in the process of becoming activated. So even now, let's say the antibodies are given monoclonal and they are wiping out or cleaning up the virus, this process has started. It would not have started if, let's say, the symptoms were too low or maybe it was started and still the symptoms are not there. But when the symptoms are there and we figured out the symptoms and we gave the monoclonal antibody, that means in the meantime, our immune system had enough time to become active as well because viral load was sufficient to cause symptoms it was sufficient to trigger immune system too so generally that would mean that there is immune system training that has happened so i would be really surprised if immune system was not sufficiently trained after an infection that was controlled with antibodies monoclonal antibodies So Eric Seven Brian says, do you still have protection after antibodies wane? In theory, correct, yes. The antibodies waning, and again, this is 
we are just talking education. We are not talking any one person's um, situation. Neither am I. Uh, I should not provide any advice. So I think that is clear. This is why there is this disclaimer down here. OK. So look, let's say the person got exposed here. Then the antibodies started becoming available. IgM first, then IgG, then, of course, IgE, IgA, and so on. And then after a few months, these antibodies, they waned, they reduced. Now, at this time, considering that the, the patient is healthy, their immune system is fine. They're not immunocompromised or they're not immunosuppressed. They're not diabetic with uncontrolled diabetes or they do not have cancers or they do not have um, you know, bone marrow issues and so on. Healthy individual. And consider that the virus is the same as before. Then when the virus brings in, comes in again, when the reinfection occurs or re-exposure occurs, then this immune system ha has produced memory cells here. That is why the antibodies start waning, because the active cells are killed. Some of the cells are kept as memory cell. These memory cells will then become active when this trigger appears, and they would once again start making antibodies. It would take some days to do that. In some people, 10 hours. In some people, 24 hours. In some people, 48 hours. It may be even more different. And in some people, that could be some at-risk individuals, that could actually be enough time to for the virus to cause enough damage to kill them while the immune system was still getting up to speed. Or let's say immune system could not get up to speed because uh, it was not working correctly or it was suppressed and so on. So that means the answer really is it depends upon the person, the virus, the time, and the time window between the infection, re-exposure, in immune systems activation. Soma and Sijoy Ghosh says, how much time is required for body to show spike protein on cell surface after vaccine? So to answer this question, I'm going to refer back to that Japanese paper. That paper was for Pfizer, I believe. And that said, within eight hours, the spike proteins manufacturing had started. Now, is there any difference between the vaccinated person and unvaccinated person in general? That is the difference, that one is vaccinated and one is not. <laughs> GIF24 says, Luffy was never into statistics. Squirrels are much more important. Yes. He really, really, he doesn't care for the latest topics. This is an interesting question, uh, dingbad dingers. Uh, do you think governments around the world will feel pressured to recognize post-infection natural immunity? as being legitimate, and if not, better than vaccine-induced immunity? I don't know. I think um, it really depends upon the medical administration to provide guidance to government, because I think politicians will not have that, um, that knowledge unless they, they're doctors or they're researchers. And if they don't have that knowledge, I don't think they can make a correct decision either way to say yes or to say no until the guideline is provided. Now, the question is the, the folks who are guiding them, how are they thinking? Do they have any biases? Do they have any leanings? We all have leanings and biases and perceptions and understandings. And so it really answer cannot be generalized because because it's going to be you can see that in certain countries even state by state or city by city there is difference in implementation of approaches
So <clears throat> YouTube's uh, 3888 says, WHO, FDA, CDC, NIH changed their views about the use of ivermectin, use of COVID-19. I personally see a few stage four cases recovered after taking ivermectin. I don't think so. I think nowadays the pressure is actually um, cause even more pressure to say this is not the correct one. So I don't, I'm not aware of any change. If even if I'm seeing any change, that is more to pressure against it. Okay, so so many say Joyce says, um, sorry, my question was cut. I meant difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated D dimers. So D dimer has nothing to do with vaccinated or unvaccinated. D dimer is a result of immune systems activity sending cytokines to the liver, uh, sorry, not liver, uh, creating the clotting if there is clotting, and then breaking of the clot produces D dimers. So in this blood vessel, when there is inflammation, and if that inflammation inside the blood vessel or to the cells of the blood vessel or to the underlying layers of the blood vessel is causing enough of the uh, cytokines here that the clotting starts and then the clot has, you can say there, it has ro ropes around it. We put strings around the platelets to bind them into a clot. When these strings break down, when the clot breaks down, which is a, also a natural phenomena, when the clot breaks down, these ropes break down into smaller pieces. These are called D-dimers. So D-dimer is really a uh, an indicator of clotting and breaking of the clot. Now, can that happen with vaccine? Sure. Can that happen with the actual infection? Sure. I don't suspect that vaccine can cause clotting with enough uh, damage that it could cause D-dimer levels like COVID. But maybe in some people it could. Generally, it should not do that. Swazi says, have you looked at the vaccinated patient's D-dimer test and compared it? No. So number one. Uh, at least not here in the, I don't practice in the US and in the uh, in Pakistan I have not asked for D dimers other than patients are over there more used to doing these tests by themselves I haven't done this specific thing that D dimers were vaccinated versus unvaccinated Dan Ward, Dan Ward says, why are young doctors setting us up for failure? They tell us if we feel bad, go to ER. My wife and I had COVID twice. They won't give us anything until after 14 to 15 days, won't prescribe meds. You know that um, it's a good question and I don't have an answer. This is um, many protocols, many guidelines, many algorithms in many countries, including my country, US, is where they say that, hey, if you have COVID, just stay at home and isolate and, and take symptomatic management. And if your oxygen drops or difficulty in breathing occurs and so on, then go to the ICU. So many countries have that protocol and if that is a protocol, the doctor is just going to adhere to that unless there is a doctor who decides that I'm going to try to do something about it. So Raphael says, is there a list of ivermectin studies somewhere? Yes. So there are many, many sites which list out all the studies so far done. You could actually, I was thinking of going over those studies and looking at them one by one and discussing their weak points and their strengths. But there are 26 studies or so. It would take a lot of days. But that may be an interesting series.
Neri has a very dangerous question. If you still have antibodies from natural infection, would it be better to get re-exposed during the, that time so that they get activated again and therefore last longer while not having severe symptoms? Not at all. <laughs> Don't re-expose yourself to the, to the virus. There is enough virus already in your body to replicate and to create um, exposure for the immune system. Please don't. This is not a, I was thinking a couple of days ago, you may have, the cool beans who have been with me for some time, they know, I think when I am in my bed. So I was thinking a few days ago that how um, dangerous it is to take a risk with this virus. For example, the folks who don't want to have a mask or folks who do not want to have a vaccine. So there are, I agree that there are folks who may not want to have a vaccine because of their health or other reasons, allergies or things that the protocol says, if you are allergic, then do it this way. Or So th there are reasons. But in general, taking a risk with this virus is is equal to taking a risk with death. This is not a common cold type virus or common flu type virus that we can handle it successfully in all cases. It's a dangerous virus, it can kill. So imagine how difficult and how tough this decision is to say, I'm gonna expose myself or I'm gonna let myself be exposed to the virus, which has a chance of killing me. That's that's not a good decision to do. Swazi says, are breakthrough cases in vaccinated people the result of being vaccinated for the original variant and not the current variants being spread? So if that was happening, then that breakthrough would occur with everyone because vaccines are for the older variant. And I want to also make sure that we understand when we say older variant and new variant, the, the spike protein for, let's say, Delta variant compared to Alpha variant and I am just thinking off the top of my head. And then let's say Wuhan variant or was that called alpha? And then the UK was beta. And then now we are at delta. The change between the early version to this is really changes, let's say, 1723 amino acids out of hundreds of amino acids. That is such a small change that efficacy could reduce, but it is not possible really that this vaccine is just not going to work anymore. Now, if let's say efficacy has reduced enough that these vaccine generated antibodies are not able to bind to this at all, or they are binding as some people created these rumors and myths by saying leaky antibodies. Leaky antibodies are a concept for chicken antibodies, not in humans, not here, but they created it. So imagine they're saying that the antibody is attached and that is just not attached firmly enough. And that is then causing to with the um, with the spike proteins management or the COVID's management. To go to your question, if this was happening, then everyone who is vaccinated will be getting infected and not be able to control it. And the pandemic would start once more, and this will be called SARS-CoV-3 pandemic. That's not happening. That means in some people, when the breakthroughs are occurring, that may have been a contribution of the virus, the antibodies, the immune system's uh, 
you know efficacy at that time their own health and there are so many other possibilities one second the definition of breakthrough is really symptoms again or infection again and we have done this discussion many times that if somebody gets exposed again after getting trained by either the infection or the vaccine so let's say they are actually good but their system has gone down dormant or in resting state they get exposed again it would take i just discussed it 10 24 48 hours before the immune system has become fully ready to respond to the virus meanwhile the person is going to have symptoms can have symptoms and if they have symptoms it is it is defined as breakthrough but really it is not a breakthrough it is even yet the immune system has not activated it will really be a breakthrough that immune system becomes active and still not able to take care of the virus which is happening in some cases or immune system becomes active and cannot take care of the virus at all in everybody, then the vaccine has failed. We are not seeing that. At least I'm not seeing that in the data. So uh, we are at eight o'clock. Let's do this. Let's stop for today. Please rem remember uh, on this Friday, we will have talk in the morning because we'll have Dr. Daryl DeMello with us and he is in India. So the time difference, we'll just do one talk in the morning at 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. So thank you very much for your time. Please do me a favor, like, subscribe and share. If you don't want to subscribe or don't want to share, just like it. That helps as well. And if you would like to support this work, there are links in the description. You can buy me a coffee or you can become a patron or you can use PayPal to support it. Thank you very much. And I will see you tomorrow. We'll continue with the Androgen series.